So uh, I want to welcome everyone today. Uh, Nina, if you want to get it recording, that'll be great. Uh, welcome everybody to today's Climate Friday virtual town hall. Our topic today is soil as a climate solution. I want to thank our staff that is making this possible. Stacy, Nina, and Amanda, thanks so much for your help today. Especially, I want to thank our guest presenters, Tori Estrada, Executive Director of the Carbon Cycle Institute, and Wendy Millett, Ranch Director at Tomcat Ranch. For those of you who are new to the Climate Center, our mission is speed and scale greenhouse gas reductions. We are perhaps best known for the key role we played in growing community choice energy from two about five years ago in Marin County and Sonoma County to 21 CCAs today serving over a quarter of the state, over 11 million Californians with 88% clean energy. I do want to acknowledge where we're at today. Uh, this past week, we've experienced the combination of what one LA Times reporter called the imperfect storm. It's just been quite dramatic with record-breaking heat wave, over 10,000 lightning strikes over three days, and now 360 some fires that we know of, and about 20 some of those that are very, very major and uh, bearing down on communities that some of us are a part of and uh, on those who we love and know. And so I want to wish to everyone uh, safety and um, uh, during this time to be careful and to evacuate early if you need to. And again, to thank you all for joining us uh, during this really challenging time here in California which ultimately really is being driven by climate change impacts. And just one science thing to share today, if you remember anything about what's going on, is that we know nine of 15 global tipping points have already been activated. We still have time to prevent an uninhabitable hothouse climate, but we have to act soon. And to address this, we have started Climate Safe California, which many of you are already familiar with, we want to accelerate existing state policy timelines so that by 2030, we achieve 80% below 1990 greenhouse levels or double current policy and net negative emissions where we start drawdown so sequestration is greater than emissions. And that's part of what today's webinar will be focused on. And the third area is securing resilient communities for everyone. There are two key principles that will be part of everything that we do in Climate Safe California. First is ensuring a just transition for workers. We have tens of thousands of people who are employed in the fossil fuel industry here in California and in utilities related to that. But the only way we're really going to be successful to move to a climate safe future is to engage the unions and those working in these areas, the building and construction trades and other trades to help solve climate change together. And secondly, we have to stop climate injustice. We have to close the climate gap. We have to ensure that lower income communities and communities of color are no longer disproportionately harmed by toxic fossil fuel development, production, and use. This needs to be woven into every aspect of what we do. So we want to enact the policies required by science. We have four legs to that stool, accelerating the phase out of fossil fuel development, increase, increasing sequestration. We want to get to 100 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent annually by 2030, above and beyond where we are today. We want to invest in community resilience and we want to fund climate action. Key part of this uh, sequestration is carbon farming and that is uh, part of the topic that we'll be addressing shortly. If you haven't yet, we invite you to endorse Climate Safe California. Just go to www.climatesafeca.org. It's a public pledge of support to accelerate aggressive equitable climate policy and what we do in California inspires the world. So our challenge today is that we get at least 30 new endorsements this morning. I'll report on it later, but I hope you will go to climatesafeca.org and endorse this. It couldn't be more urgent. So please join us in moving Climate Safe California forward. Again, I want to welcome Tori and Wendy, our guest speakers. Our topic today is soil as a climate solution. I'm now going to hand it off to Tori. Get out of here, who is our first speaker. Take it away, Tori. All right. Let's see here. All right. Um, thanks for having me, uh, LA and the Climate Center. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be in dialogue. So what I'm going to cover today, I have a very short amount of time. I thought I'd just 
so it gives some slides to kind of kick us off in terms of conversation. Probably talk a little less about carbon cycles work. We can get in that in the Q and A, but just thought I would. We we felt it's important to kind of ground the conversation a bit. Um, most people have to hear this four or five times to really sink in. Um, so just wanted to give a little bit of background on the connection between ag, soils, climate, and carbon, um, and then a little bit of a framework of how we're engaging agriculture as a climate change solution. So first off, um, it's important to understand the system we're working in. Uh, so we're talking about climate change and carbon. Uh, we're not only talking about fossil fuel emissions in the atmosphere, but we're also talking about oceans. And then today we're talking about the second largest sink actually, which is the terrestrial system, soils and trees. Um, so it's important to think about that. Um, in a lot of our dialogue, we see carbon as negative and it certainly is negative in the atmosphere and certainly in the oceans with ocean acidification. But actually carbon in the terrestrial system is a positive thing. And when we increase the carbon content of soils and trees, we actually drive other ecosystem services, uh, including increased water quality, productivity, habitat. So um, invite you to think positively about carbon <laughs> in our soils. Um, and what's actually interesting, and we all know this, is that um, agriculture is the active practice of actually moving carbon through the atmosphere under the power of sunlight to build essentially the, um, the bodies of plants um, that actually drive much of the productivity on the planet. So again, um, it's this, I think, sixth grade in California photosynthesis, um, combining photons, CO2, plants actually make their own bodies. And the one thing to take away, just to have a thought about, is all the carbon and carbo carbohydrates, um, which drive our food system, um, flora and fauna on the planet, is actually carbon from the atmosphere. Um, and then for me, it, because I actually don't come from agriculture, I come from sort of ecology background. If we also maybe fast forward to high school ecology um, and think about well, what's the undergirding foundation of ecosystems, it's that first trophic layer, which is a photosynthesis uh, part of this where plants, organic matter, and then the next level earthworms, it's really the foundational system of everything on the planet. So in some ways, when we talk about agriculture and its form, if we're doing it right, we're actually engaging and improving the very foundation of ecosystems um, on the planet. So sun as transforms itself as energy in the form of carbon into um, our biological systems. So when we talk about carbon farming, it's not just carbon, it's carbon as a driver of ecosystem productivity. Um, so I invite you to think about, when we talk about carbon farming, we're also talking about restoring the ecological function of our agro, agro ecosystems, which certainly have been transformed. Um, but it's also seeing that agriculture can be productive if the ecosystem that it's dependent on is actually enhanced. So that's the, the aspiration, I think, of carbon farming is to focus on that. So this is for all the geeks in the, uh, in the, <laughs> on the webinar today. This is just a, an illustration of the potential of some of the work. This is a, a graph showing um, the modeled results for adding compost to rangeland systems in California. This is a research effort we were involved in. So in, in year one, we added compost, which is that hockey stick, the top of that hockey stick, we added carbon to rangeland systems in both coastal and the Sierra systems. And what was interesting is we see this, this background, the dots, this increasing carbon content in the soils, which increases every year and continues to increase even as the compost that was added to the system. The important point here is if, if we actually can manage agro ecosystems to take in more carbon, we actually see over time because of increased plant productivity, more carbon in soil, more water being held in soil, more productivity, more carbon being drawn down, we actually see the ecosystem that supports that system actually increase its capacity over time. And even, you know, 50 to 60 years out, 
it certainly diminishes, but it's certainly at a much higher level in terms of carbon content than where we started. So this research we did focused on compost on rangeland and it's not the only practice, but as a practice that we could employ um, in, in coastal California, showed us the potential if we could manage the assistance for carbon, what the consequences could be. Um, so we should be thinking about our farming systems, which are dependent on soil and, and photosynthesis as what role does carbon play in managing those systems and thinking about where that carbon situated on farm, which is obviously in the crops that we're producing, um, whether that be plant material or animals, um, the soil, so the carbon that's stored in soil as soil organic matter is a huge reservoir uh, of carbon. And then the standing stocks on these farms, whether that be below ground, but more importantly above ground and, and trees and, and shrubs that are part of that. Um, and so this is just an example of work, one of our ranches we, or farms we're working on the Mendocino coast, uh, looking over a two year span of different soils, same cropland system, but with different management. You could see, you know, visibly in the soil there, the increase of carbon, um, the richness of the soil just over a short period of time. So systems can respond, um, actually, in some cases, cropland quite extensively to carbon uptake over time. Um, and just to step back, you know, this potential of increasing carbon in soil as being a, a stock for the planet you know, is, is actually being realized outside of the United States very clearly. The French for the last almost decade have understood the role of soils um, coming out of the IPCC report, um, sort of putting forward this concept, the initiative, a challenge to the, the global community to think about the role of soil organic carbon and this idea that if we were able to reduce, uh, draw down 0.4% of carbon and turn it into soil organic carbon, we could offset all global emissions. Now, I'm not sure we can actually do that at scale, um, but the idea, the, the importance is the idea that there is a connection between um, our atmospheric carbon soil systems and that agriculture can play a role. It's not a panacea. Um, there are a lot of barriers to that, but it needs to play, be part of the portfolio um, of our work. So for our work, and I think many others, um, in addition to all the other things we're trying to manage in the agricultural system, putting carbon as sort of the center of the way we're managing these systems. And if we think aspirationally, could we actually deploy agriculture in a way where we're actually in a net situation, we're actually drawing down more carbon than actually we're using or emitting in our agri ecosystems. And it's that aspiration, at least from Carbon Cycle Institute, that are engaging producers in that very endeavor. So there are many ways to do that. Um, there's above ground restoration of uh, forestry, agroforestry, and particularly in our riparian, our stream systems. This is a, a photo of one farmer's effort over decades to reforest their riparian areas. And not only the carbon benefit of that, which we have good data around, but also increases habitat, improves water quality for salmon. So you have these multiple benefits. And there are farmers that are actually out there doing this. I know we hear a lot about some farmers that are not doing this, but there are actually a ton of farmers who have been engaged as stewards of the land. And it's those folks we, we're trying to connect with. So again, they're sort of bringing vegetation or trees and plants back into our agroecosystems in the form of windbreaks, um, hedgerows, um, you know, reintroducing uh, trees back into rangeland systems, um, uh, managing, which Wendy will talk about managing our grazing in a way. So pre prescribed grazing, the way what we mean by it is actually managing grazing for carbon uptake. Um, again, as I alluded to before, adding solar organic amendments to our cropping systems and our rangeland systems. And then um, cover crops as well. Um, sorry about that. Um, so instead of having bare soils, um, actually keeping crops on soils year round and decrease photosynthesis and carbon capture. Um, so one question becomes sort of how do we quantify this? Uh, actually USDA working with Colorado State who actually does the emissions inventory for the US government um, has a quantification tool where 
down at the county level, we can actually estimate uh, the carbon capture from different practices at scale. And so this is a tool that actually the state of California uses currently for its investments in uh, natural working lands, including agriculture. Um, and of course, where we have, and we do have local level data. So on like for Marin, we have compost data. We also for the North Coast have really good local data and research on um, the carbon accrual from restoration of our riparian areas and creeks. We're using that local data to drive our planning and implementation. And so what we do, and it's maybe similar to the folks that work on energy efficiency, which is where I come from, um, our work at CCI is we basically go on the landscape working with producers and their um, technical assistance providers to do a full landscape assessment of all the opportunities to um, draw down carbon on this uh, piece of land. So as you can see from this uh, map, uh, we're mapping out and doing ecological assessments of these pieces of land. And then the lower right, you can see identifying over time the range of practices that a producer can take on and then working with that producer similar similarly in the building sector around energy over time bringing the resources to actually scale up so we're not just talking about one or two practices but over time multiple practices stacked within these agricultural systems and then from comet planner we can estimate both the annual and the long-term sequestration sequestration actually is exponential so it, actually grows over time, plant material, soils uh, work in that manner. And then over a jurisdictional level around Sonoma County, we could start to aggregate the implementation of those plans on farms and start to see that uh, agriculture can play a role. Um, we work a lot with resource conservation districts, which work with farmers to implement conservation. Um, and we're actually have a fairly well developed infrastructure for tracking implementation and the impacts, including carbon in these landscapes. Um, this tool, Project Tracker, is what our resource conservation district partners use. And so I'm not gonna get into this, but we're a small organization working with resource conservation districts. We're working across 40 counties, um, over 160 producers um, at various levels of planning and implementation of these practices. And you can see at full build out, um, the impact of drawdown can actually be significant. There's still a lot of barriers, which we can talk about more, but um, all to say is that California does have an infrastructure to deploy this. And the one thing we do have is relationship, long-term relationships with farmers, which we can leverage um, to actually get the kind of behavior change that we're looking for in terms of the types of managements and practices we're looking for. And then I'll just end by saying, because um, it's not well known, that for some time now, carbon sequestration in the land base, including agriculture, is part of California's climate strategy. It's the one that's most underdeveloped, but there is a strong and growing policy framework and programs that actually support this with technical assistance for planning and outreach and implementation. So I will end there and pass it over back to uh, Ellie. Thank you, Thank so, you so much, much Tony. Story. That was great. Uh, Wendy, we're going to pass it on to you now. And uh, while you're getting set up, Wendy, I just want to invite everybody to put any questions you have into the Q&A button, which is to the left of the chat button on the bottom of your screen. And uh, we'll get into the Q&A after Wendy presents. So next, I'm really delighted to have my friend and colleague, Wendy Millett, who is the director of Tomcat Ranch. Please take it away, Wendy. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks, Ellie, and thanks, Tori. Um, I'm sorry I'm not on the face screen, but um, thank, you, thank you for those two of you who are flipping slides for me. So um, just to get started, I run Tomcat Ranch, which is a grass-fed beef business and an educational ranch. I came from ranching that took me to conservation, um, and then uh, the marriage of conservation and ranching um, and food production is how I ended up doing the regenerative ranching work that we do today at Tomcat. The sort of amazing thing that drew me to this opportunity to work there was the science that we're doing because, uh, you know, uh, Tori, thank you for covering a bunch of the key points around it. But, you know, we, in order to draw down carbon, 
um, regenerative, we, we need all the tools in the toolbox and regenerative agriculture is one of those. So if you could flip to the slide, the first slide that says, has the cow on the front with drawdown on it. Um, it, I don't know how many of you have read Drawdown before the report, um, but in it, uh, regenerative agriculture is listed as one of the important solutions for land-based drawdown. Um, and managed cattle, uh, managed crops are both parts actually of the solutions, which as a conservation person, I can say, and I don't know all of your backgrounds, but, um, you know, agriculture has not been my my um, my life's work conservation has been, but I've, the opportunity that we have to raise food on working land to regenerate the planet and do a bunch of the soil work that Tori was doing, talking about and to raise food at the same time is what captured my attention here. And so, you know, it, it, what I've come to understand is it, it's sort of the how we do agriculture that makes the difference between whether agriculture can be carbon beneficial and actually beneficial for a lot of other things too, or whether it's going to be uh, a negative. I'm going to kind of deep dive on a few of those things today, hopefully not too deep dive. But so flipping to the next slide, if you would, called Viewpoint. Uh, in case some of you don't know much about regenerative agriculture, Raton Lal is a very esteemed scientist, um, and he shared the slide with me um, talking about regenerative agriculture and some of the many tenets of that and some of the many practices. And I won't deep dive on that because I'm sure you're going to get shared the slides here. Um, uh, but there are some very well-known practices, including compost that Tori just mentioned, um, cover cropping, no-till, uh, grazing, grazing animals, um, moving them around a lot um, in, a, in a way that mimics the natural herd process and many others, which you can see on that slide. So jumping to the next slide that says more than just carbon at the top. Um, carbon's a huge piece, but what I especially love about regenerative agriculture and the opportunity is that it's not just carbon. And as I said at Tomcat, we're doing science on a whole bunch of things and studies to um, make sure that what we say is validated and we're looking at these, you see a bunch of circles, 10 different topic areas so that we can see that we actually, while we're improving carbon and climate stability, we're also improving biodiversity and we're also improving food security. So all of these things on this list, one through 10, um, are part of what we see as a system, whole system approach to doing the ranching work that we do. If you'll skip to the next slide that has the regenerative ranching and the sunshine at the top, um, uh, Corey gave us some of the science lessons from sixth grade, and I think I slept through science class in sixth grade. So if some of the rest of you did as well, the slide that I have um, uh, says incorporates grazing animals. It's just a little bit of an explanation um, about, all, uh, in addition to what Corey, uh, Tori put in there, um, what role the grazing animals play. And so, it's pretty basic, you know, the sun, Tori described that process as helping all the plants do photosynthesis and grow and put sugars down into the soil and feed the roots. Meanwhile, the cows are going around and they're putting all their manures and, and urines and that is compost, that is fertilizer um, of a natural kind that all the microbes need to actually feed uh, the system. And so there's quite a lot of role that these grazing animals, and you can see that on the Serengeti, you can see that in the Great Plains where the buffalo, all of the great natural natural grasslands in our planet have had massive herds of grazing animals. And so there is a natural system here that we're trying to emulate, that we are emulating and trying to mimic. Um, if you'd skip to the next uh, slide called the true cost of beef, um, what we did in one of our science studies with PricewaterhouseCoopers, who's a big national accounting firm, global accounting firm, was looked at across those many um, priority areas that we're looking at and a few others actually for the purposes of the report. We tried to see the kind of dollar value equivalency of, you know, a regenerative beef business like what we're doing versus a feedlot beef business. Um, if you don't know much about grazing cattle, the way simple version is, is where we're doing the regenerative beef, 
they're only eating grasses and they're on the ranch from day one to the last day um, versus an industrial system that has a whole lot of time transport um, and feedlots and feeding in anim, um, feeds that have been shipped in from other places. That's a lot of where the high impact um, of beef that you're commonly hearing about is coming from. So you can see on the right hand side, if you put a dollar equivalency and there's a long report, there's a lot of numbers, but a, quite a lot of value um, to a society on um, that $6, almost $7 um, positive impact versus a negative impact of industrial beef. So that reports on our website. You're welcome to take a look at it if you're interested. Uh, skipping to the next slide, just talking a little bit about the known benefits. Um, and many people are talking, and this is another reason why I got really interested in this piece of agriculture is, you know, we have all these beautiful working lands in California. Uh, how do we keep them in production, raising food in California for Californians? Um, and it's a, you know, it's a cost issue from the people who own and manage them, whether those are private landowners or public landowners. So there's, this is a kind of a long list. I won't go through that. But um, the other thing that we did is we profiled a lot of people who are doing uh, regenerative agriculture practices. And just to tell their story, ranchers and farmers tend to be pretty much focused all day long caring for their land and their animals. So the thought that they're going to be out there marketing and telling their story, even if they've done amazing things, is pretty rare. So we took it upon ourselves, given that we are an educational organization, to reach out, capture those stories, um, and really try to put hard numbers to these people who, you know, are doing an old conventional orientation, were really struggling in their economics and changed over and now are seeing not only carbon benefits and biodiversity, biodiversity benefits and water benefits, but also seeing um, increases and in improvements to their revenue and to their associated communities. Um, those profiles are on this website, uh, regenerativeranching.org. Uh, next slide. Uh, one of the reasons that we're really excited about this whole thing is we need a rural renaissance. Um, you know, rural America, uh, I've had a chance this summer to drive through <laughs> across the state. Holy moly, we need a new way of doing agriculture that is beneficial, that isn't extracting from the soil and from nature, but that's actually giving back and not just giving back to our land, but to our water systems and to our air systems and to our food and to our communities. So this is the list that's, uh, you know, just many of the benefits that we're seeing from regenerative agriculture producers around the world. We're, we didn't make this up at Tomcat. We're just following uh, all of the innovators out there across the world um, and trying to do our part to document and you know, trial different things. Um, so the next slide highlights white oak pastures, and I wanted to share this one with you because um, white oak did a very detailed carbon footprint focused on the, their practices. So this is a big um, operation in Georgia, big grass fed operation. So these animals are always on grass. I love that picture because they're never in a feedlot. Um, they have a whole range of different animals trying to mimic how nature would do it on if you've ever gotten to be on the big plane, see all the animals that live together. And uh, just jump to the highlight that red, red arrows showing uh, net total emissions um, is down um, because of the beneficial practices. There's soil carbon, there's vegetation carbon, there's a lot of benefits that they're seeing on carbon. and um, and that is a really exciting report. This is pretty recent. Um, the citation, if you want to look at it, is also on here. Um, I didn't assume everybody wanted to go deep on these things, but if you do, I wanted you to know where to find that. Um, jumping to the next slide, uh, and this is about some of the changes that we've seen thanks to Point Blue Conservation Science, who's our on-site partner. They're there thanks to Ellie, actually. Um, and have done an absolutely incredible job helping us document, as I said, some of the changes. So this change is about native perennial grasses, showing that this is a little map of our ranch. And if you see the different years, you'll see how much more native perennial grasses we've seen across the ranch. 
that's been accomplished simply by changing the way that we've been grazing our animals. Um, and the key thing I want to talk about around that is also carbon because native perennial grasses have deep, deep, much, much deeper root systems than what's typically growing um, in California as annual grassland. So this, this slide, while it's about grasslands, also um, is telling us about carbon uh, or the potential for carbon capture. And so the next slide, if you jump, also just showing you a little bit about the different kinds of grasses and shrubs and forbs. We've seen a decrease in these annual grasses, which again, those are very short, very short um, uh, roots, not gonna be really great at sequestering carbon. And some of these other species, as uh, Tori could have told us if he had longer, talking about the carbon farm plants, shrubs, perennial grasses, um, much better at car catching carbon. So changing the biodiversity on these lands also is going to make a difference um, for the carbon. Uh, next slide is birds. Uh, I'll just skip through that one. It's just fun. We've seen a, all kinds of birds at the ranch and not a carbon um, matter, except that, you know, where you have birds, it's telling you you have habitat and where we just talked about the different kinds of plants that are there. Seeing all the birds um, tells us there's insects there. It tells us there's functioning, ha healthy ecosystems. Okay, so then the next slide, if you would, says changes, and there's a map of a bunch of green dots. Uh, there's also some gray dots on there. So this is the one that measures our um, carbon at the ranch. So we've got 40 test plots where we're looking at how well we've done in, in sequestering carbon on the ranch. Our ad, average soil carbon is about 4% across the whole ranch. Um, and uh, so a whole, a whole bunch of talking points here to look through if you wanna go through it. But I think um, kind of getting to the highlights, uh, during the last four years, which you all know was an intense drought that we all survived through, um, we saw an increase in 40 oh, in carbon in 46% of our monitoring sites. Um, some people will say, well, you didn't even get to 50%. And we have to actually go back through and say, yes, but this was during a drought. And there's a big difference in carbon sequestering potential where there's a lot of water. And that's why in Georgia, for example, that report that I showed you, they saw incredible improvements um, because it's a very wet place. California will be slower to see in probably most places, um, unless it's heavily watered system, the change, changes that Georgia got to see. But we're really proud of the work that we did, those green dots with a lot of hard work by our livestock team. Um, and a couple of test plots for compost mixed in there as well, thanks to the Marine Carbon Project. So the next slide, uh, the work at Tomcat Ranch is really focused on these three ways that we can help Im improve the spread of regenerative agriculture because we've seen the benefits and we're so excited about sharing them um, and helping to transform the way our agriculture is done, the way our land management is done, the way our food is raised um, so that it's healthier for ecology, it's help healthier for the people, it's healthier for, uh, for our economies. And the uh, next slide, which is the last slide, there's a big map with a lot of yellow. The reason I put this one in there is because the potential for regenerative agriculture on grazing lands is so huge. All that yellow stuff, um, those pixels, uh, they are um, public lands, grazing lands typically. And then a bunch of them are forest lands, which also have grazing lands. So, if regenerative agriculture and a more holistic systemic system based approach to agriculture could be accomplished at uh, the scale of public lands, we would see a lot more benefits for all from carbon to water to all of the various benefits that I talked about. So I hope that was a quick but um, uh, but helpful download. Um, we've got a lot more stuff on the website and I'm happy of course to answer questions. I'll hand it back to Ellie. Thank you so much, Wendy, and thank you again, Tori. Fantastic presentations, uh, full of excellent information. Just to, a few of you have asked, we will have these slides available uh, on our website uh, by early next week at theclimatecenter.org slash webinars. Um, so we have some great questions here, um, and I would ask that Tori 
if you put your uh, video on. And Wendy, if you, I'm not sure if you can put your video on from where you are, but if you can, that would be great. Um, so first from um, Alex Gilchrist, what do you think is the right price per ton of carbon that would make a difference to farmers and help drive adoption of carbon farming? Tori, are you able to join us? I, I can buy audio, but somehow my video says it's turned off by the host. So. Oh, okay. We'll yeah. work on that while you answer this question, if you <laughs> would, and, and Wendy can jump in as well. Yeah, I, I think uh, it's a good question. We, we've looked at this and I, and I think it's gonna be um, geographic specific because of input costs, labor costs, but I think from some of the work we've done, something in the range of uh, 60 to $100 a ton would make a huge difference. Um, I, we think would tip, tip this in a very serious way. Like one of our <laughs> ranchers said, if you could pay me to grow carbon, I can grow the heck out of it. Um, but that's not what farmers are incentivized to do. And, and, and to remind folks that there are a lot of farmers and ranchers that are actually very moderate to low income. So not everyone is, uh, large scale corporate farmer. So, but that's what we've been looking at is that sort of somewhere in the range of 60 to hundred dollars a ton, which may sound very expensive. Um, but having worked in other sectors and, and understood the real cost of like what energy efficiency and some of these other things cost, it actually is fairly cheap relative, but there is a lot of elasticity around what, what that number needs to be to incentivize ranchers. Yeah. Thank you. Wendy, anything you want to add to that? No, I think Corey's just right, and the ranchers will grow um, <laughs> what they need to. So this is just an extra benefit um, uh, for people who are already managing uh, their lands and wanting to, you know, hopefully the incentive that they need to help them make some sh shifts that could be, you know, could help bring all those benefits that we were talking about. Yes, that's great. Another question. For both of you, can you address the issues of methane generation from dairies and ranching operations, as well as nitrous oxide from crop irrigation and the use of land application areas to dump large amounts of processed water? Uh, how does that fit into what we're describing in terms of regenerative agriculture? Uh, if it's helpful, I'll talk, to, talk about the, the um uh, uh, the ranching side of it, we don't do dairy, so I'm not I'm not well um, schooled on that one. But on the on the ranching side of things, uh, it was interesting. Just this, uh, this morning, there was a NPR about um, methane and um, an additive that's actually a seaweed that is 98% uh, successful in reducing methane in the cattle's rumen. That's their one of their stomach. And um, so there's opportunity. The reality is, is breaking down um, heavy, fibrous, grassy materials um, is going to re reduce, uh, going to um, uh, create methane. So it, it, it won't eliminate, we don't, by having animals, whether they're in a feedlot system or a grazing uh, natural system, it is just a natural byproduct of a grazing animal. So if we seek to uh, address that, one of the ways to do that is through uh, this, you know, a feed additive that's becoming increasingly popular. And the other thing that people are starting to study is actually uh, the role of bacteria. Um, and how did nature keep this all in balance over the time? Because there were millions of grazing animals on the grasslands for for a long, long time. And um, so what, what do we not yet know about um, how the biology works for a contained system? So I, I don't know enough to say about the methane um, in the dairy. So I'm just going to leave that to somebody else who knows more about that. Okay. Yeah, I could, I could cover. Please. That. I think at a high level, what I would say to folks is the methane and, and nitrous oxide has to be addressed. And, and the slide I showed around Comet Planner, um, for the, there are dairy practices for methane reduction. Um, but it is actually accounting for methane and nitrous oxide in those greenhouse gas estimations. Um, I think there's some, there are definitely a lot of opportunities in dairy, uh, especially small to medium sized dairy. Um, I think the, the issues around management for large scale dairies is, is partly a, 
a, a management issue, but it's also an economic issue. But one of the things we've been trying to sort of crack the nut on, not that we want to incentivize essentially <laughs> large scale dairies and um, manure management, um, but there are opportunities we think about manure as a source of compost. Um, so where appropriate, and, and again, one size fits all for any of these systems um, that we're talking about is probably not a good assumption to make because there are a lot of on-farm realities to deal with, but there are opportunities in actually being deployed through state programs like the Alternative Manure Management Program where dairy farmers um, particularly are innovating uh, to not only reduce um, methane um, through ways that Wendy's talking about, but also through manure management, but actually changing their systems um, to address greenhouse gases. So we have a lot to learn, but there, there are innovations happening in that space. And, and just to reiterate, methane and nitrous oxide are part of this. But I would just encourage you not to think in terms of the ledger that carbon and soil don't play an important role in that. Because where we can't get methane reductions, we can actually get other reductions if we think about the farms holistically. Great, thank you. Uh, from Michael Mayfield, why do we think soil carbon sequestration is the least developed climate change mitigation strategy? I would think it's the lowest tech solution and therefore cheapest to employ. Yay, thanks for saying that. We hope everybody will say that. That's completely right. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> There's so many million dollars and billion dollar solutions being proposed out there. Um, and meanwhile, we've got lots of grazing animals out on the planet and we've got lots of farmers out there who could be doing cover cropping. Um, uh, and so giving them, giving them some incentives to get those new practices in place, which are in fact old practices. If you talk to old time ranchers and farmers, you know, we just got very mechanized in the industrial agricultural world. Um, and we need to use that power of uh, the machinery and the technology just to embrace uh, a more holistic, uh, integrated system now. Thanks for, thanks for that comment. I might be a little controversial and say, actually, I think in the rest of the world, outside the United States, I think soil carbon sequestration, so like the EU has very strong policies, including farm policies. It's been underdeveloped, I think, particularly in US contexts. Uh, for a whole host of reasons. Um, and I think one of the challenges is for us to think about agriculture not as a homo homogenous sector, right? Um, ag in some quarters has a very bad reputation. So I think there's a bit of distrust, um, but I, not putting that aside, but I think there are a lot of opportunities in agriculture, but we have to actually mend um, some of the age old fights between agriculture and the environmental community, for example, just to put it out there in the climate community too, there's a bit of distrust. Um, so for me, I see it as in my work on energy efficiency where people were very skeptical of that as well. And I think we need to show people really working models of this so people understand what it is and what it isn't. Um, but I, I think there is a We've seen in Sacramento a sort of bias against agriculture because um, I think there's a bit of distrust about can it actually perform um, just to own that. Um, so it's our job to to build models and 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 show that it actually can be you know effective. And I think we're on that path um, in California to to show that. Yeah, that's great. Uh, could you actually go a little further into this question of um, why is there distrust in the environmental community about carbon sequestration through soil management and other nature-based solutions. Tori or, or Wendy. I that I, yeah, I'm happy to tackle that one. That's a good question. I mean, when I was, I was at the Nature Conservancy for a dozen years, for example, and um, it just was not on our radar um, until very recently. Um, and um, I think probably because most of the focus is on, you know, protecting species and protecting landscapes and or in, in working on air quality and water quality. There's so many uh, efforts just above, to look above the ground that um, and, and, and the other pieces, as any soil scientist would tell you, is we know so little. 
I don't know if you've heard the statistic before, but a teaspoon of biodiversity of soil has more biodiversity in it than the rainforest. We don't even know a fraction of what is in there. And I don't think soil science was a sexy thing. Um, those are probably just some basic, you know, human comments on it. There may be some bigger systemic things, but soil be, was an ag thing. And so it just hasn't been on the environmental conservation radar really till quite recently. Tori, you want to add anything to that or? No, I think it's a good overview. I, I think, um, again, I, I think it'd be, in, it's, it would be interesting to see because there's a lot of conservation groups that actually work, are working with farmers um, and agriculture. Um, I do feel from the climate sector, the way we've been counting, you know, what's valuable. So what we can count gets valued. And, and if you even look at some of the methodologies for local government, it, it specifically excluded, not because we didn't have the science, but it particularly excluded soil systems. So in some ways we played forward um, what we could count. Um, and we didn't ask the question, can we count soil? And so that's, that's the research I mean, carbon projects that I've done have sort of raised that question and answered it like, yeah, we can answer those questions. Now the question is how do we deploy it, right? Similar to energy transportation. So I think it's lagging that way, but I think in some ways there's a bit of questioning because it's just not mainstream in the way we talk about climate, at least in the United States. When I was in Europe, it was not a question. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was like it, their climate strategies assumes sequestration at an appropriate level. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so I just think it's the dialogue here, which is why this is great, is what's needed um, mm -hmm. to get past the mythology to, you know, educate each other about what the opportunities are and what the barriers are. Yeah, that's great. Thank you both. Uh, from Alice Sung. Why is it that big ag does not practice regenerative ag and how can we change the system to make all ag regenerative? Oh boy, Tori, you want to start on that one? <laughs> sure. Well, yeah, I mean, sweeping comment, I mean, I think there are people actually are doing it, but I, my thought is sort of you know, it's, it's, the, it's the economy in general. So the current economic system based on productivity um, doesn't value some of the externalities, particularly around carbon. Like, so I said, our farmers like, you know, and that's why they're doing it. If, if there's an economic signal around this, right? In addition to all the other things they wanna be stewards of the land, pass on their land to their, um, their children. But there's a, in the current, you know, predominant mainstream economic ag economic system, it's, there's very little direct benefit for conservation improvements and for carbon. So I don't think it's innate to farmers, but most of farming at that scale is driven by profit. And, I, and I, we haven't found a way to you know, integrate carbon and other ecosystem services. Why we have USDA Natural Resource Conservation Services, we've been trying since the Dust Bowl to back end conservation, although underfunded, but I think farmers understand it, um, but there isn't a strong enough economic signal and then there's not enough infrastructure in terms of, I think, technical support for farmers to, to try to learn and find ways of innovating it on their farm. So part of this is like, they're not sort of pat answers to how you do carbon farming. Part of it's like, we have some answers, but then we're gonna have to spend some years to fine tune our approaches, right? And there just isn't, enough um, resources and value on that kind of engagement. But it's what farmers do <laughs> if they have support and, and, and the right economic signals. Yeah, I totally agree, Cor uh, Tori. And, and just to adding the, um, the piece around also the social, um, we've done a few different, seen a few different reports in the regenerative ag space of late, of what are the barriers to adoption of regenerative practices and um, it's amazing how strong the social uh, factor is. Mm -hmm. And you have to kind of get in the mind of uh, the farmers and ranchers that many, many farms and ranches are owned um, in families and the how you do it is passed on. And many rural farm communities um, are pretty tight. And so <clears throat> being the person who tries something different 
um, <laughs> I think every regenerative um, ag person I know will tell you that they're the only one in their community who, or one of the few, um, that were still kind of all the, all of the oddball innovators out there um, paving the way for doing something new. So that, there's that piece too, in addition to um, you know policy and incentives and all that that Tori already talked about. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that uh, sequestering carbon in soil and habitat, agricultural lands is a top priority of the Climate Safe California campaign that the Climate Center is leading with many partners across the state. Please go to climatesafeca.org to endorse it today. So if we have time for a few more questions. Um, I want to ask, so what are the foundational current state climate policies and programs that support this kind of work and what more should we be doing? Um, and I could probably share this with um, Climate Center, but um, as I mentioned, the carbon sequestration, the land base, so not only agricultural lands, but in forests, wetlands, other natural systems is, is the fourth pillar. And actually interesting enough, coming out of that, most of the ag programs are being, there's several programs focused on soil improvements, manure management, getting to the methane question, and also water use efficiency. So thinking about the energy connection on farms, so how to reduce, um, increase water efficiency and reduce energy consumption. Those are all existing funded programs out of our climate dollars, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. Those are all active programs that are being funded at the state level through California Department of Food and Ag. What's more interesting um, in our work, because I think it's holistic, because we touch on habitat, water quality when we do these improvements, is that there's actually an equal amount of money coming out of uh, Wildlife Conservation Board for Habitat Improvement that's connected to uh, agricultural systems. Department of Water Resources has, we've had a number of our partners funded for the water benefit. So for every um, percent increase in soil carbon, we actually get more water retention in our soils. Um, so there's a connection there. And then also through the ad adaptation. So there are a number of state programs that are funded these efforts and a lot of local entities, including resource conservation districts are actually much like the energy efficiency sector, sort of developing plans for farmers and grabbing these various pots of money. Um, so that's um, kind of the, the lay of the land, but what the ag sector is missing, um, like other climate sectors is um, we don't have a formal scoping plan. So coming out of AB 32, every sector has got a goal and a set of strategies that's in an you know, ARB approved scoping plan. Ag and natural working lands has been lagging. So I'd say for me, the most important state policy importance of the next year is to make sure ARB and its sister agencies, including California Department of Food and Ag, actually develop and finalize a goal for the sector with a set of strategies, programs, and incentives to scale it up. That's what's really missing. That's why this area has been underdeveloped is that we don't have parity with other sectors in terms of a goal, a set of strategies and policies. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Wendy, anything to add to that? Okay, hope we didn't lose Wendy. Uh, one question. No, sorry. Oh, go ahead, please. Did yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah. yeah, I got too excited. I forgot to take my mute button off. Um, <laughs> at, the, at, the, at the state level, Tori's got it covered for sure. I just add on the federal level, you know, we have a farm bill that uh, is massive. And the more that that bill um, is incentivizing more regenerative soil beneficial climate smart practices, um, the faster we'll be able to move this, you know, farmers <clears throat> across the country, especially on the crop side, completely depend on the farm bill money. And, um, and they depend on crop insurance. And we're working on a project um, with a group out of DC to come up with a couple of crop insurance products tools mm -hmm. that actually would be available for people who do regenerative practices, because right now, there's nothing. So if you're a farmer and you actually want to change, um, it's pretty risky. If you've got a bad year or happen to be in Iowa and get hit by a derecho like they did last week, um, you're counting on crop farm bill to pay your mortgage for the year. Um, and you, you can't get that if you're not doing the exact practices and exact crops that, that, are, um, that you're 
that are part of these subsidy programs. So changing that is going to be a massive uh, lever to pull. Great, thank you. Uh, in California, water is, as a resource, is reducing dramatically. Uh, this is from Kathy, Kathy Falconer. One needs water for agriculture. What statistics do we have that water retention per acre of regenerative farming versus non-regenerative? How, how does regenerative ag and healthy soils impact water? Shori, you want to go? I know we both got lots to say on this one. Yeah, I guess, you know, to make it short, I will share a link. We actually did uh, work with Nature Conservancy, U.S. Geological Survey, it actually was part of the fourth climate assessment. We actually calculated out um, the water savings, the, the retained water from regenerative practices using soil organic matter increases. What I'll tell you is a 1% increase in water would mean more water held in soils than all the surface water storage we have in, in the state of California. So how about that? <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> so we're, we're, so soils should be reservoirs. We should be thinking about as reservoirs for long-term recharge and yeah. we currently don't. Well, and I'll just add too, because I think one of the things, if, if you don't know how the whole soil thing works, the simplest way that I was taught to think about it is soil can be built to be almost like a uh, house, you know, with multiple layers. It has to have layers to it and then all the biodiversity can thrive in it. And, uh, and that's part of what we're trying to do with increasing carbon and building a healthy soil structure. And then there's places for that water to sit in. And right now, California soils are beat hard and dry and don't have anywhere to hold water. So it all sheets off when it should be sponging right down into the ground. Great, thank you. We're, we're quickly closing in on noon and I wanna be respectful of everybody's time. I would love to continue for another half hour. There are fantastic questions here in the Q&A. I wanna let everybody know that we will post on our website a copy of all the Q&A. We will ask our speakers to respond to a few more of these in writing. We'll also save for everybody to see uh, whatever's in the chat box. And of course, this presentation today and all the slides will be available as well. And you can reach Tori through the uh, Climate Carbon Cycle Institute and you can reach Wendy through Tomcat Ranch as well. So um, and my final question for our esteemed guests, what do you see on the horizon? What's the most important thing for each of us to do to push regenerative agriculture forward, healthy soils forward, to push the ability of nature in the next 10 years to get us to the goal we need to get to, which is around 100 million metric tons additionally sequestered per year by 2030. I'll just say in a word, I think education, I think most people don't know that there's a different way to raise our food and care for our lands. And so talking about regenerative agriculture to all the sectors, so because there's benefits in every sector of changing our practices. Absolutely. Tori. Uh, I already alluded to it. If you already or have aspirations working on state policy, um, a state scoping plan for agriculture is huge. And then on the local level, um, connecting agriculture in our climate action planning. So we're working a, a lot on climate action plans and building out ag chapters. So creating local programs and ways for people to connect, including buying regenerative made, you know, produced food and supporting that at a local level. Cause that's where climate change is all gonna hit. It's, all in everybody's community. So really localizing our action is, is important. So that, those are two areas I would suggest. Great. Thank you so much, Tori Estrada of the Carbon Cycle Institute, Wendy Millett from Tomcat Ranch. Fantastic presentations. And thank you everybody for joining us today. We had over 200 participants. Um, I don't have the final number of endorsements for Climate Safe California that we got today, but uh, my last number was around 25 please go to climatesafeca.org, endorse this campaign, this urgent need to sequester more carbon, to dramatically reduce emissions, and to ensure resilient communities as we move into this climate-changed, uh, imperfect storm of our future. Thank you again, Tori and Wendy, and thank you, everybody. We look forward to seeing you in September for our next Climate Friday that will be about sustainable mobility. It'll be September 25th, and we'll let you know more about that by email. Thanks again, everyone. Be safe, and we look forward to being in touch.
Take good care. Sure. Thank you. Thanks so much.